Everybody got SQ2 up here? Remember I reminded you I added a bonus question? One I'm sure you can all answer. Special Quiz 3. So regarding submission of Special Quiz 3, which is due this Thursday, same format, I will expect that you download the new version of Special Quiz 3 and submit that. And I think we're pretty much straight away now for this exam confusion situation at the end of the week. Certain of you who wish to be departed on Saturday will be expected to take the 46th lab final, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Friday, followed by the 46th final, which will be in Carlton 100. However, for those of you who will take the 46th lecture final on Saturday, how many? Okay. We'll convene right here for that at 10 a.m. You folks who take the 46th lecture final on Saturday will stick with the 46L final Friday night. <coughs> Carlton, 7 p.m. Okay? So really the people that I must hear from, must have a note from, are those who will not be here on Saturday and who intend to take the 46L final early, means starting at 5 p.m. on Friday. Just so I know how many of you I have to accommodate. That's all. If you've given me this information, we're all set. <clears throat> now, regarding chapter 23, a reminder. I urge you all to go to my Absolutely Chemistry website where the class videos are found and view these two videos. These two videos provide explanation related directly to the information you see on, in chapter 23, these pages. And in the video, you will see, or you will hear, find, see, explanation and analysis of periodic size trends. I trust you remember that at least for A family atoms, as we go left to right across the period, the general size trend for atoms is that they get progressively smaller. Usually not substantially so as you go from atom to atom. Neighboring atoms, the right side atoms, is usually is it often in many cases just a little bit smaller. Well, when you go across, for example, period two, where you've got eight elemental members, by the time you go through a small size shrink and a small size shrink and a small size shrink, etc., you find that a neon atom is a lot smaller than a lithium atom. Period three, an argon atom is a lot smaller than a sodium atom. And the general size trend for a family atoms within a family is that as you go down the family, the atoms get progressively larger and usually substantially so as you go from period to period. In other words, lithium, sodium, same family. Sodium a lot bigger than lithium. Potassium, same family. Potassium a lot bigger than sodium. <coughs> Presumably in 2045 lecture, you talked about the why of this. Why are these trends observed? But if you have not, 
or if you'd like reinforcement of your understanding of those size trends, there it is. Because the first general consideration that we will pay attention to in chapter 23, which will be starting in a short while, is that of atomic size. Because it will underlie the first consideration that we will make in establishing a collection of considerations which will allow us to rationalize differences in strengths of Bronsted, Lowry, acids, and bases. So in that regard, back to chapter 18. But in chapter 18, we just said, here is a list of acids, and here's how their strengths, comp strengths compare. Now we're going to talk about why their strengths, comp strengths compare as they compare. Why is this acid stronger than that acid? That's chapter 23. In the main, our intention now having just been stated. So let's get back to chapter 22, electrochemistry, and finish this chapter. Again in table 2 we have got some non-standard half cells. Just a couple. 23 and 39. In brief, we talked about 39 last time because it was part and parcel of question 24. Where he coupled the half reaction involving the oxidation of copper in the presence of strongly basic solution to become copper sulfide with oxygen functioning as an oxidizer over water. And we posed the question when we did that analysis. We had a half cell which was non-standard. How do we get the E0 value for it? Well, we talked about that last time. The next question is, how do we get the E values that you see tabulated for these non-standard half cells? Well, it all follows as a function of pH, no more, no less. So for half cell 23, here's the analysis. Here's the half cell reaction. But at pH 7.0, this is not a standard half cell because the hydronium ion molarity is standard only at one molar, pH 0, not pH 7. And for this you see a tabulated E value, not E0 value, of plus 0.41 volts. Well, where's the 0.41 volts come from? Here it is. Just apply Nernst to this half cell, okay? E0 half cell and a 0.059V over 2, okay, times Q. Hydronium ion molarity, react, I mean product, and partial pressure of hydrogen denominator. All right? What's E0? Well, this is, if you consider this under standard state conditions, this is the standard hydrogen electrode. It has the Z e assigned or arbitrarily ascribed E0 value of zero. Well, there's E0. And here's Q. At pH 7, here's the hydronium ion molarity. Quantity squared. But we're still going to consider a partial pressure of hydrogen in one atmosphere. If I change the partial pressure of hydrogen to some other value, I'd have to tell you what it is. But at this pH of 7.00, which is this hydronium ion molarity, with the hydrogen partial pressures fixed at 1.0 atmospheres, you do the arithmetic. There it is. That's where the E value comes from. Now page 2225. Concentration cells. We didn't really discuss this early on in chapter 22. You remember how we constructed an electrochemical cell which is capable of delivering usable electrical energy when we were dealing with zinc and copper strips and one molar zinc sulfate solution, one molar copper sulfate solution. We recognize that to avoid short circuit, we have to physically separate the two half cell processes, the two half cell reactions from each other. And in so doing, in the anode half cell, we had a zinc bar sticking in zinc sulfate solution, so zinc in contact with its own conjugate oxidizer. And the copper bar sticking in the copper sulfate solution with the copper bar in contact with its own conjugate oxidizer. Well, that begs the question. 
do electrons flow between copper and hydrated copper ion if these species are in contact with each other? Do electrons flow between zinc and hydrated zinc ion if these species are in contact with each other? And the answer is yes. How about that? But with these species in direct contact with each other in a given beaker or half cell, there's no change in copper ion molarity or amount of copper if it's the copper bar sticking in the presence of hydrated copper ion. So what about this concentration cell? Where copper metal is reducing its own conjugate oxidizer to oxidize itself to its own conjugate oxidizer's product while reducing this hydrated copper ion to copper metal. So this, the conjugate oxidizer of this, gets reduced to copper. The conjugate reducer of this oxidizer. Tell me, for starters, what is E0 for any concentration cell? Given that a concentration cell is a cell in which a reducer is reducing its own conjugate oxidizer. What's E0? Zero? Has to be zero. zero. Because you got the one half reaction, in this case, copper becomes with six, with six water molecules, copper plus six water molecules becomes hydrated copper ion and two electrons. E0 is minus 0 0.34 volts. And for hydrated copper ion, collecting two electrons to become copper metal and six molecules of water, E0 is plus 0 0.34 volts. E0 is always zero. Well, what's del H zero for any concentration cell? Well, we stated here it's zero, as well as del S zero. Does that seem reasonable to you? As this reaction runs, are bonds broken? Are bonds formed? Yes or no? Yes or no? Of course. This thing's torn apart. The water molecule, the copper ion bonds are broken because this thing is getting reduced to copper metal. And bonds are being formed. This thing, as it becomes oxidized, glues on the water molecules and makes this thing. But however many moles of this gets oxidized and however many moles of this gets reduced, equals however many moles of this which is produced and however many moles of this which is produced. So however many bonds of a given type, copper ion between water molecules that are broken is equal to the number of copper ion water molecule bonds that are formed. So, zero. No, well, that's why del S zero is zero. Del S zero, remember? That's standard state conditions. That means I'm setting up this system with this at what molarity? Well then, nothing happens if the molarities of these copper ions are the same. But if I change the molarities of these copper ions, then something can happen. That's why this thing is called a concentration cell. Because it depends on difference in concentration between the solute species. Okay? Molarity of this different from the molarity of this. Well, it also follows that a del A zero is zero, and del S zero is zero, and del G zero is zero, and as we've already recognized, E zero cell is zero. In a moment then, we'll answer the question, what is the thermodynamic driving force for this thing? All right, now here is my $64,000 Van Gogh Authentic sketch. In this case, of a concentration cell. Salt bridge. Light bulb. Doesn't that look like a light bulb? Hell no, but we'll take it to be. Okay. Socket. The intention being, I want electrons to flow through this wire and make the light bulb glow. With a concentration cell. Now then. The question is, 
does it matter which way the electrons flow to make the light bulb light up? No, light bulb doesn't care. Just give me electrons. I don't care which way they flow. They flow this way or this way. But standard practice of representing an electrochemical cell is to draw the anode compartment on the left and the cathode compartment on the right. Doesn't have to be that way, but that's standard practice. All right, so let's imagine we want this to be the anode half cell, and we want this to be the cathode half cell. Well, if that's our desire, so that our sketch is like electrochemists draw this stuff as a matter of format, and I'm going to deal with two different copper sulfate solutions, one molar and hundredth molar. I have to make a decision. If I want this beaker, the left side beaker, to be the anode half cell compartment, do I put in this beaker the one molar or the hundredth molar copper sulfate solution? What do I put in this beaker? Which means by default, what do I put in this beaker? Because if I put the one molar here, I gotta put the hundredth molar here, if I put the hundredth molar here, I gotta put the one molar there. And I want the electrons to go this way. Right? Which means this is the copper strip I want to get oxidized and convert to hydrated copper ion. While in this beaker, I want hydrated copper ions to swim over to the copper strip, collect electrons as they've flown through the wire into this copper strip, and get reduced to copper metal on the surface of the copper strip functioning as the cathode. Okay? Which copper sulfate solution do I put in this beaker? If I want this beaker to be the anode. All right, let's have our usual vote. How many vote one molar? How many vote hundredth molar? That's terrible. Because if your total grade rests on a response to this question, then the majority of you have just not passed the course. Do you realize if I place the one molar copper sulfate solution in this beaker, which I can, I can pour whatever I want in here, and the hundredth molar copper sulfate solution. If in this beaker oxidation occurs, the one molar copper sulfate solution will become more concentrated in copper ion at the expense of hundredth molar copper sulfate solution becoming less concentrated in copper ion. So I'll ask another question. If I take these two solutions and a cylinder and I pour 500 milliliters of hundredth molar copper sulfate solution into the cylinder, okay? Then I carefully and peacefully pour one molar copper sulfate solution, 500 milliliters, on top of the hundredth molar. Okay? You understand what I did? There's my cylinder. I put in 500 milliliters of 500 milliliters of 100th molar copper sulfate solution. And on top of that, I poured 500 milliliters of 1 molar copper sulfate solution. In fact, if you want, I'll imagine, first I put in the 500 milliliters of the 100th molar. And I'll imagine I got some magic <coughs> boundary separator there. Then I pour in the 500 milliliters of the one molar, and then I can remove the magic boundary separator so that now the solutions, if they will, can migrate into each other. If I come back and observe this system, say a month later, you really think that one molar copper sulfate solution will now have become more concentrated? And the 100 molar copper sulfate solution would become even more dilute? You think that would happen? I hope you don't think that would happen. <laughs> it's like taking a pack of cards, throwing it up in the air, and expecting it to fall down in a nice neat stack, ace through king, each suit separated. Well, I will allow you to try that experiment for eternity. All can try that experiment for eternity. You think it'll ever come down stacked in that pack? No. Your horse sense tells you that, doesn't it? So 
So your horse sense ought to tell you that what is really driving this concentration cell is a change in entropy. It's called entropy of mixing. Because you know doggone well for the two solutions of copper ion that I put in the cylinder. If that cylinder and its contents stand long enough, I will find one and only one copper ion molarity throughout the cylinder. And it will be less concentrated in one molar and more concentrated in hundredth molar. Gee whiz, what will be the molarity of the copper ion in the cylinder after it has stood for a long, 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 long time? Half molar G whiz, right? Because pretty much I'll be diluting, diluting one molar to half molar. <laughs> in a hundredth molar, you know. You know, if I keep it to one sig fig, the resulting molarity will be half molar. Remember when we, early on in chapter 18, when I showed you the one molar acetic acid solution, a given volume and an equal volume of deionized water, and we treated it with methyl orange indicator, and I says, predict the color. And I got color predictions all over the place because you forgot to pay attention to what was actually going on. Which is nothing more than dilution. So if I want this to be the anode compartment, I have to put within it the copper ion solution which has copper ion at the lower molarity. Because that is the solution in which oxidation will occur. That's the only way the copper ion molarity in this solution can increase while at the same time the copper ion molarity in this solution decreases. Because we know doggone well if we put these solutions in contact with each other that's what will happen. And that's the way the concentration cell behaves. So to have the electrons flow this way, to have this be the anode compartment, this be the cathode compartment, that's how we construct the system. When does this system come to equilibrium? We really just told you the answer, although we didn't state it as such. Under what conditions will this concentration cell system come to equilibrium? When the copper ion molarities in each half cell are the same, you betcha. That's when the electron transfer process shuts down. And that'll be about half molar copper ion in each half cell. What's the thermodynamic driving force? Well, it has to be this because number one, delta S zero means standard state conditions. Okay? Now initially this is standard state copper ion, but this ain't nowhere close to standard state copper ion, is it? And just as we discussed the two copper ion solutions in the cylinder and recognized that the more concentrated solution will eventually become less concentrated, well, it will start to become less concentrated as soon as you make the mix. As the less concentrated solution becomes more concentrated, we are recognizing that if I have 500 milliliters of one molar copper sulfate solution and 500 milliliters of hundredth molar copper sulfate solution which we just discussed, okay? Imagine the sum of the entropies of these two copper ion systems. Now we put the copper ion systems together. On recognizing that natural mixing occurs, right? And mixing ceases to occur after the copper ion molarity is uniform throughout at about 0.5 molar. Which has the higher entropy? The two individual 500 milliliter samples, one, one molar and the other one hundredth molar? Or this approximately half molar copper ion solution? Which has the higher entropy? You remember what spontaneous changes show? An increase in entropy. 
And we are seeing. We don't have to do anything. Just put them together and we'll see the systems mix. So once the systems mix, they're showing us, hey, we mix naturally. So it must be true that the entropy of the intermediate molarity system compares how to the sum of the entropies of the isolated systems. Remember, nature is driving naturally to increase in entropy. So the intermediate has got to have the higher entropy. It's showing you. That's what it does. You put them together and they mix. That's why it's called entropy of mixing. Which we said early on in this conversation. Now you can do the arithmetic. If I have copper ion in my anode compartment, hundredth molar copper ion. Oh. Make it this copper ion 2.0 molar in my cathode compartment. Under these conditions, E cell is plus 0.097 volts, keeping in mind that E0 is zero. So the only terms that matter in calculating the electrochemical potential for a concentration cell are the Q terms. And N in the denominator. That's all that matters. And on the galvanic protection. Something I'm sure you've all heard about. Or at least my bet is that you've all heard about. Simple example. The simplest or more, I should say, perhaps the most common example is that of base metal iron being placed in contact with base metal zinc. That means elemental iron being in contact with elemental zinc. Which is a stronger reducer? Well, if you don't know straight away and you use the table two information, you see zinc is a stronger reducer than iron. Okay? Now, do you think it's important to protect iron? Do you recognize that all construction, building roads, building bridges, building skyscrapers, all that stuff, which use metal, you can bet they're using iron. Because it is the most abundant metal in Earth's crust. And it's cheap because of that. And it's durable. It's strong stuff. But unfortunately, iron has a tendency to oxidize spontaneously in the presence of moist air and oxygen. Oxygen in this here stuff called air? Is there moisture, particularly when it rains outside? You betcha. Because the oxidation product of iron, which is hydrated ferric hydroxide, which shows this, pardon me, as an idealized formula. Anybody 46L this term, get to assignment 10? Make this stuff? Iron rust. A better formula is Because the number of water molecules contained in a quote unquote per mole of iron is not a defined number. So we idealize the formula so that in 46L you can write equations correctly and stuff like that. Okay? But this stuff is very thermodynamically stable. Iron readily oxidizes in the presence of moist air, oxygen plus water, to become this stuff. But physically, this stuff is lousy, stable-wise. You make this stuff, falls off. Exposes new iron to the oxidizing atmosphere, if it is in an oxidizing atmosphere, which it must have been, otherwise that would have not formed in the first place. So how can we stop this? A simple, common way is galvanic protection. You play zinc. The best way is just to take the iron you want to protect and put a surface coating of zinc on it. 
tiny surface coating of zinc. Now zinc is a stronger reducer than iron. So in the presence of water and oxygen, zinc is oxidized preferentially because it is the stronger reducer. But when zinc oxidizes preferentially, Like iron, it makes a hydroxide compound, but this stuff has got a pretty good structural integrity. So it doesn't fall off the iron. And once this is formed on the outside, then the inside iron, which is protected now from the uh, oxidizing environment of oxygen and moist air, no longer oxidized. In a nutshell, that's galvanic protection. Now then, the last topic in chapter 22 is that of derivation of E0 for new half cell reactions. Illustration extracted from the book. I forget what the question number here is. Let me see. Question uh, 2232. where we ask you to recognize that if I take this half cell, iron being oxidized in the presence of water to hydrated iron plus two, oh, with this E zero value, followed by further oxidation of hydrated iron plus two to hydrated iron plus three, for which the E zero value is minus 0 0.77 volts. These are each in our Table 2, contained in Table 2. If you add these together, you get this as a new half reaction. This is clearly recognized as a half reaction because it's got electrons in it. Because no net cell reaction has electrons in it. Okay? The question is, how do I get E0 for this thing if I don't know what it is? First, recognizing that I cannot add this to this and get E0 for this thing. That doesn't work. The explanation for why it doesn't work is in the notes. But I'm not going to make a big deal out of that because after I show you this, I show you a better way to do it. A better way based on something with which we are already familiar. Now then. On page 2228, you'll see an explanation of why to get E0 for this by combining these half reactions, okay, cannot be done by adding the E0 values. The explanation is here. The E0 value for the new half reaction is not this. What you have to do is to go through free energies because the energies are additive. So you have to set E0 for each half cell reaction equal to minus delta G0 over NF, okay? This the rest is just arithmetic. So you take minus delta G0 over NF for half reaction one, minus delta G0 for half reaction number two, I just put them together, put a minus sign out in front. That becomes this. What's in? Well, there's a new half reaction that's got three electrons. So here is the combination of the top part, the numerator part of this puzzle. You don't need a value, you don't need to use the Faraday. You know, it's part of the puzzle algebraically, but it's not really part of the puzzle arithmetically because the Faraday cancels numerator denominator. Arithmetic is easy. And there it is. That's E0 for this half cell reaction. For, what did I call it up there? Star with a circle around it? Good enough. But there's a better way to do this. A better way which will allow us to get E0 values for new half reactions without fooling around with table two. Without doing this convert E zeros to delta G zeros, add them up and divide by N stuff. 
hint? Do you remember what we did at the end of chapter 21 regarding determination of Ka values for strong acids? What information did we use to get Ka values for strong acids? Where was that information contained? Hmm? What information did we use to get Ka values for strong acids? What was the source of our information? Nobody remembers? Well, then why should I tell you? Better way. Use thermal data from, from what? Table one. Just like we did to get the Ka values for the strong acids. Let's take a look at an example. can apply what we're now going to demonstrate to this circle star half reaction if you want. You got the E0 value. Okay. Let's consider getting E0 for this half reaction. If you look at table two, you will see this half reaction is not contained in table two. But you will see in table two, two half reactions which illustrate the oxidation of copper to copper sulfide. One in the presence of one molar hydronium ion, strongly acid system, or the other one in the presence of one molar hydroxide ion, strongly basic system. Okay? Take a look at table two. Right now. For the two half reactions to which I've just referred. So I don't have to spend time to write them on a the board. You got this stuff? Look at it. Use it. It's all right. See? Table two. Half reactions. Hmm. I forgot to note the number of the half reactions. Are you seeing the numbers of the half reactions? What are their numbers? Nineteen and twenty-six. Okay. Nineteen shows the oxidation of copper at pH fourteen in the presence of hydrogen sulfide ion to become copper sulfide. Twenty-six oxidation of copper with hydronium ion as a product, so standard state molarity is one molar. And of course, E zero nineteen is much greater than E zero twenty-six. We discussed this last time. Why is that the case? Why is E019 much greater than E026?
Copper sulfide is a material containing the extremely basic anion component sulfide ion, isn't it? So do you expect that sulfides are much easier to form in basic solution? Much more thermodynamically stable in basic solution than they are in acidic solution? Even though they're very acidic, this sulfide is very stable in acidic solution. It's a heck of a lot more stable in basic solution. Because clearly the more acidic the system, the more effectively you attack any base. So forming a sulfide is guaranteed to be more difficult in an acidic versus a basic solution. No question about that. So look at the half reaction we've got on the board. Tell me about the E0 value for this half reaction compared to the E0 values for 19 and 26. Let's note the E0 values for 19 and 26 respectively. 19 is, well you're looking at it, you tell me. What's E0 for 19? Plus 0 0.76 volts. And if my memory is right, this is plus 0 0.134 volts. Is that right? You're looking at it. Okay. Tell me. E0 for this half reaction. How must it compare to these numbers? Before we do any arithmetic. How do we know the E0 value for this half reaction, which is not in table 2? This is standard state hydrogen sulfide line. Okay. How do we know E0 for this half How do we, how does the E0 value for this half reaction compare to these two values? I'm listening. How does E0 for this compare to plus 0.76 volts? For this one, E0 is bigger or smaller than plus 0.76 volts? Smaller, why? Isn't 19 more basic than this system? Okay. How does E0 for this half reaction compare to plus 0.134 volts? Larger, why? Why? Is this system acidic or basic? Well, if I got this at standard state concentration and this at standard state concentration, gee whiz, what kind of system pH do I have? Come on, acid-base chemistry, let's use it. You can bet stuff like this on the final. <laughs> acid-base chemistry throughout the place. And what are we going to wind up with? Rationalizing strengths of brazilary acid bases. Well, the latest foundation for understanding of thermodynamics, all stuff in water solution. Got the acid base table? Look at it. KAH2S. 1.1 times 10 to minus 7. Do you see that? We see that? Well, if KAH2S is 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7, give me a G with KB for hydrogen sulfide ion. You think it would be close to 1 times 10 to the minus 7? You're damn right. It has to be. It's 9.1 times 10 to the minus 8. That's pretty close. Okay. So if I got KB, HS minus 9.1 times 10 to minus 8, KAH2S, 1.1 times 10 to minus 7, and these are both in the same pot at the same molarity, standard state molarity. What's hydronium ion molarity for the resulting solution? We did this in chapter 18. <laughs> now put it to use. What's hydronium ion molarity for the resulting solution? H2S is in the solution, 1.1 times 10 to minus 7 is its Ka value. And HS minus is in the solution at the same molarity as the H2S, Kb is 9.1 times 10 to minus 8. But the key is to realize that the HS molarity and the H2S molarities in the solution compare how? They're what? Equal, Equal aren't they? So if I read the expression in my mind's eye, 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7 equals hydronium ion molarity times HS minus molarity divided by H2S molarity, right? 
and the HS molarity, HS minus molarity and H2S molarities are the same, then what the heck is the hydronium ion molarity? It's Ka, isn't it? 1.1 times 10 to minus 7. So the pH of this system is about 7. Right? Hey, it all follows from what we've been doing and it's not hard. But it does obligate you to pay attention to what we've been doing. And that's when chemistry starts to make elegant sense. When the puzzle parts start to fit together. The most damning statement I've ever heard about chemistry from any chemistry student is why is it taught as this bunch of disconnected considerations. And that's the way general chemistry textbooks are written. Well, chapter one is like, it's about measurement. Then chapter two is about partial pressures. And there's no relation. It's like this is a total different consideration. Then you go to this chapter on thermodynamics. Then you go to this chapter on phase diagrams. And a stupid author hasn't had enough sense to realize that a phase diagram is a free energy diagram. It makes no connection. And you're sitting there, oh, it's a brand new topic. I don't understand it. How could you understand it? The idiot that wrote the book doesn't understand it. That's disgusting. Because you the people that lose, and that's what I get mad about. I don't want my students losing. I want my students winning. I don't give a damn what happens to those people, and I mean it. I mean it. They ought to know better. And that was today's sermon. <laughs> Okay, so now let's do the arithmetic. Table two, table one, pardon me. We're going to table one. You know, end of chapter 20. And what are we looking for? We're looking for the delta G sub F super zero values for the components of this system. Whoop. What is this? This is standard state copper. So delta G sub F super zero for that is zero. Okay. And now as I look at the table, I see this is 12.1. I'm going to multiply that by 2 because of this coefficient. Copper sulfide minus 53.6, leaving out the units for expeditiousness, and minus 27.8. Okay? Now what do I do to these data? What do we do to these data when we were processing data like this to get Ka values for strong acids? What do we apply to these, this information? called Hess's law, isn't it? Because I want delta G zero for the reaction. Thus, delta G zero R equals that plus that less this. That's a two. Okay. And I get minus 105.6. And I know this is equal to minus NF E zero. Okay. So these signs are going away, and I will solve and write that E0 is equal to 105.6 times 10 cubed, so I can go from kilojoules, which is the unit on this, to joules, all right, divided by NF. What's N? Well, it's 2. And this is 96,500 coulombs. If I divide a joule by a coulomb, what do I get? Volts! That's what I want. So I get plus 0 0.547 volts. Or call it 0.55, that's good enough. And just as we knew before we did the arithmetic, the E0 value for this thing had to be intermediate between 19 and 23. Because a lot less basic than 19, but a hell of a lot more basic than 26. And there it is. That's the best way to play the game. Not this stuff. But this is standard fare, what you will see even in textbooks on electrochemistry. So I included it. 
But to me, the table one, this stuff, that's an easy way to get these zero values. Not this monkey business. It's all right, but I think this is far more direct. Because I guarantee, if you've got E0 information for half reaction, you've got to have it, the corresponding materials contained in table one. The thermodynamic properties, data table, got to be there. Okay, and we go to chapter 23. Now then, the preliminary stuff in chapter 23 is all stuff you should have heard about in 2045. You read it. You know, why the periodic table, you know, the vertical columns are families and the horizontal rows are periods and that kind of stuff. And, and some comments about the general chemical and physical aspects of metals and non-metals and stuff like that. So I'm going to chapter 23. to page 23.8. Well, actually, 20, section 23.3 is where we're going to start. Atomic radius. Covalent radius. And look as I may, I can find very little meaningful discussion of these very fundamental considerations in textbooks. <coughs> They're all in a hurry to do calculations, these textbooks. But I don't see much attempt on their part to make sense out of what the heck the calculations are about. And that, to me, that's an abomination. It hurts my mind when I'm trying to learn about this wonderful stuff. So I will offer the following regarding atomic radius versus covalent radius for a given element. Okay? Pick any element you want except helium and neon. Because they don't make bonds. They're not known to make bonds with any materials. Yet I see covalent radii cited for helium and neon in data tables. What the hell does this mean? They never made any bonds with anything. How can they have a covalent radius? This covalent radius is a measure of the size of the atom in the bound state. So it's right up to bed. I don't know what you're talking about. And they make no attempt to explain it. They just show you, here's the covalent radius of helium. What are you talking about? It doesn't bond with anything. What does this mean? You don't explain that part. <laughs> it puzzles me. If it comes from calculation, I could care less about these calculations. How do you do calculation on a bond radius for something that doesn't make bonds? What the hell does that mean? What's it good for? Okay. <laughs> it's like telling me a lead balloon lead-filled balloon under these calculation conditions will float in an atmosphere of neon. Do the calculation all you want. Then go stand yourself under this balloon and see if your calculations keep it up in the air. <laughs> How will the covalent radius compare to the atomic radius for the same atom? Covalent radius, a measure of the atom in the bound state. Covalently bound state. Atomic radius, a measure for the size of the atom when it's all by itself. The atomic radius is larger. Do we agree with that? Hey, what component of an atom stabilizes its electrons? What? What component of an atom stabilizes the atom's electrons? The protons and the nucleus.
nucleus. They're the plus things that pull on the electrons. Well, why do you think atoms tend to bond? And we know atoms tend to bond, right? All over the place. You think of this, oh, hurt my foot. That bonds strongly in there, right? You think iron atoms aren't bonded strongly to each other in a sample of iron metal? If you don't believe that, go buy yourself a hammer and go whap! Oh, damn it! I mean, the iron hammer head didn't fall apart, my head did. Those iron atoms must be bound strongly to each other. The result of the experiment has just convinced me. Well, now I'll go stand under my lead filled balloon and see what happens there. I don't care about that stuff. To me, that's nonsense. Hey, it must be true that from the simplest possible perspective, the main reason why atoms form bonds is the valence electrons of the atoms on bonding with each other get more stable. And the only way they can get more stable is to get closer to the respective nuclei, right? So the covalent radius of any atom has got to be smaller than its atomic radius. Now then, there is a nitrogen atom. Doesn't it look like one? This atmosphere is full of nitrogen atoms, but they're not free. They're all covalently bond, bonded. So get out your super, super, super sensitive tweezers and catch one. Okay? And hold that nitrogen molecule by the end. Another pair of tweezers, pull it apart. Which you probably wouldn't be able to do, because that triple bond is damn strong. <laughs> Beaten up by a nitrogen molecule. <laughs> nitrogen molecule one, tough chemistry student zero. Okay? But nevertheless, we'll get Sam Strongman from the Gators to assist the beam, he finally gets the nitrogen molecule pulled apart, so now I got a nitrogen atom. So there's my nitrogen atom. Next to this nitrogen atom, I'll draw this picture, and over here, I'll write the symbol N, and over here I'll write another symbol N. Ah. If you could see a nitrogen molecule, what do you think it would look like? I should imagine at this stage of the game in chemistry you should have an idea, a good idea. You think it looks like a horseshoe? Dempster dumpster? Hmm? A collection of grapes on a vine? What does a nitrogen molecule look like? Me? <laughs> Poor nitrogen molecule. My bet is it looks like an egg. Because here's a nitrogen atom, general model, a sphere. Another nitrogen atom, general model, a sphere. They get together with each other. The valence electrons are shared quite effectively because they result in a strong triple bond, maintaining the structural in integrity of each and every individual nitrogen molecule. So when you take a sphere and a sphere and mush it together, mush two spheres together. But there's a limit to how far you can mush the two spheres together. Do you recognize what the limit is? You can't bring the nuclei too close. Right? You can't bring the nuclei in contact with each other because they repel each other. In physical chemistry class, they deal with problems like this with what they call a Morse potential diagram. we worry about that later. Okay? So you wind up with a thing that looks like an egg. If you don't believe me, go get yourself two squeegee balls and mush them into each other. You're going to have something that look like an egg. Now, what happened to the size of our nitrogen atoms when two of them merge with each other to become this egg? Well, they, they get smaller. If the difference in size is this much, I don't know, but I know they got smaller. So we'll leave it like this. Now then, how do I express the size of my nitrogen atom in the bound state? For the free atom, it's just the center, you know, to the exterior surface. That's the radius. 
with the exterior surface not being a defined fixed quantity. And this is defined by radial probability. Hey, range of probability for a hydrogen atom shows us that its single electron has a finite probability of being found any place in the universe for a single hydrogen atom. But when you take that electron and imagine it to be removed from the nucleus of the hydrogen atom by a millimeter, the probability is really close to zero, but it never gets to zero. Well, if I have two atoms like bound to each other, defining radius, covalent radius is not difficult. I take the distance between two atoms, nuclei, I just take the distance between the centers of the two atoms, nuclei, and I divide it in two, okay? And there's a covalent radius. But I realize, right off the bat, I got a problem with size because the nitrogen atom in the bound state does not have one given size. It doesn't just have a covalent radius. It also has a distance to this exterior surface, this exterior, okay? And these are all larger than this covalent radius. That part of the part I call van der Waals radius. So already I'm recognizing, when you start to talk about sizes of atoms, you're dealing with a can of worms. Now let's take a look at another consideration. There's the hydrazine molecule, never mind its name. Condensed formula is N2H4. Hey, in this molecule, I also have a nitrogen covalent radius, because the nitrogen atoms are bound. But for this molecule, is the covalent radius of nitrogen atoms the same as it is for the nitrogen molecule? Hell no! Here I got a triple bond, here I only got a single bond. Here the observed size for the nitrogen atom is bigger. Now comes the further problem. How do I want to measure the size of this nitrogen atom in the hydrazine molecule? Do I want to say it's just this? Halfway between the nucleus, take the distance? Because I've got to realize, in this nitrogen atom, in this nitrogen-containing molecule, there's also one, two, three, four NH bonds. Well, where do I draw the line if I want to measure, observe the size, the covalent radius of the nitrogen atom with respect to hydrogen? or the covalent radius of hydrogen with respect to nitrogen. Do I take this bond distance and divide it by two? That doesn't make any sense because the electronegativity of this is far greater than the electronegativity of this. And when these, this atom merges with this atom and their valence electron clouds overlap to make this bond, they don't show you no definite boundary line like when you go from Florida to Georgia. Now you're entering Georgia. Here you're entering Florida. Hell, that doesn't happen here. <laughs> There's no definitive boundary. Upshot, you talk about the size of atoms, you've got a problem. Very difficult problem. But at least we can say, which is what we've already said, covalent radius larger than atomic radius and the general size trend, which also applies to covalent radius, is to get progressively smaller as you go left to right across the period for a collection of A-family atoms. Now, if you want to do yourself a good service on learning more about these size trends, you will view these videos, and we'll pick it up from this point tomorrow.